Hey, Tony Gaston here popping in, little video. Now, every now and then I'll do a little bit more of a teaching video and it's a little different. Some of this, if you already are on TonyGaskinsAcademy.com, then you may have taken a course similar that taught some of these things. And being that it's November too, TonyGaskinsAcademy.com is down right now in the sense of the courses are closed. And so just see the ones that you want and you can get in position and get ready for like Black Friday. So I've been getting a lot of emails from people. Hey, I want to get this course, get that course. The courses won't be available until Thanksgiving Day. So, you know, mark your calendar for that. But I want to touch on this because as I was sitting here thinking and I'm like, OK, I need to be able to touch on something that I keep receiving and that I see happen so much. And this is something that is always plaguing the human existence. Humans in general, male and female, always dealing with feelings for the ex. And you have to understand, there are some relationships that you get back together and it works out. And you hit it off and you ride off into the sunset. You know, my wife and I are one of those relationships. But I always say we are an exception to the rule. Typically, typically your ex is your ex for a reason. That's on average. And so you have to understand that. What you also have to realize is that love does not leave. Love does not leave. Love stands, it fights, and it gets stronger. So when someone leaves you, you are not in love. They are not in love with you. And if they are in love with you, they love themselves more, which is nothing wrong with that, and you're not loving them. So when a relationship ends, it's because at least one of you are not loving is not loving the other person and love has to be affirmed confirmed meaning if i'm giving my wife love in order for us to be in love she has to love me in return or vice versa love has to be accepted and reciprocated for you to be in love and for the relationship to be strong enough to last. When that's not the case, that's when it turns into a breakup. So a lot of times you'll hear this confusing stuff of, you know, I really love, I really love this person. That was the love of my life. I know I was in love. So how can you say if it's love, it doesn't leave? And the reason why I say that is because you could have loved your ex, but your ex did not love you in return. Because if you loved your ex and they truly loved you in the real sense of the word love, then you would have never broken up. Unless, again, it's extenuating circumstances like family forced the breakup religion, race, country, you know, something else that's outside of the relationship that just you could not be together. It's against the law. You'll lose your life, lose your license, whatever it may be. We're not talking about those things. We're talking about the on average relationship. So when, if you have gone through a breakup, you got to first realize it's a breakup. And so you have to gather yourself and get ready to move on with your life. So step one would be get distance. You got to get some distance. And when I say get distance, what I mean by this is not just distance from your ex, but also distance from the people and things associated with your ex. And so if you want to heal, and you want to grow and you want to move on with your life, getting distance means you're not talking to your ex, you're not talking about your ex, and you're not seeing your ex. And of course, all of this is 
not applicable to those with children with the person. So you got to take what you can from this and leave the rest because if you got kids, you're going to see them. But get distance could also mean just not talking and seeing them unless you absolutely have to. So understand that. Now, in this stage of getting distance, you have to know yourself. So if you are strong enough, and that's a that's a long shot, but if you are strong enough to see your ex text you or call you and not answer the phone, for me, what I would call that is like a vitamin. Like if I know I'm on and I know I'm that deal and I know I'm a good person and I have to leave my ex, if I have to leave somebody, this hypothetically speaking, not literal, and she is calling me and calling me and texting me, for me, that'll be a, a battery in my back. That'll be like a vitamin, like, yes, I know I know I was good. I know I did right. I know I was the best thing that ever happened. And now you're regretting it. Now you're regretting it. So for me, I wouldn't be tempted to answer the phone or to text back. I, I could let somebody text me, text me, text me. If I'm off you, I'm off you. But that's my personality. You have to know yourself. If you're not that type of person to where if this text come in and it's a good statement or it's a good old question it's pressing a button or it's a trigger if you're the type of person that you know after that you could be tough and play tough for a day for an hour for three days but eventually you keep looking at that looking at that looking at that you got to get yours off and you got to go and let them know how you feel and you got to scrape them and put them in order if you know that's the case then for you, getting distance means you need to block your ex. I mean, you need to block their phone number. Getting distance also means you need not answer any unknown numbers. Sometimes people who are being weak, they will block their ex, but then they answer the private call, knowing that it's a 50% chance that that's their ex. And deep down, they want to see if there's their ex. They want to hear from their ex. And they want to, you know, answer that phone, but be able to say, well, I had my ex blocked, but they called from a different number. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so you got to understand that in this distance, in getting distance, this also may mean cutting off your ex's family members. And it doesn't mean that you're never going to speak to them again, but what it may mean is if you talk to your ex's mom or dad or sister, brother, best friend, anytime you talk to them, it's going to make you think about your ex. It's going to make you miss your ex. It's going to make you wonder what your ex is doing. Your ex will probably be the topic of conversation at some point in this conversation. So when you need to get distance, you got to cut off the family and the friends of your ex. You're not being nasty. You're just setting boundaries for yourself. You're setting boundaries so that you can heal and you can get you some distance so that you can process things and you can begin to, to move on. Now, six months down the line, you may be able to you know, speak to your ex's mom. Of course, even one week, if you bump into her at the grocery store, hey, how you doing? And you keep it going. If it's somebody that you cannot cut off, somebody you cannot let go of, like your best friend who happens to be the friend of your ex as well, then getting distance means setting boundaries in your conversation. So what that means is when you are talking to this mutual friend or their family member, you let them know, hey, I'm healing and I'm growing. And so I do not want to talk about such and such. And if you're going to keep bringing him or her up, then I have to cut you off. I won't be able to talk to you. And so you set those boundaries to see if this person really should be in your life. 
Because if this person really should be in your life, then he or she is going to respect those boundaries. The reason why I'm saying he or she, because this you could be a, a man or a woman watching this. And they're going to respect those boundaries and not bring up your ex. They're going to move on and they're going to act and talk like nothing ever happened. Like it's just you, you completely clear of all this stuff. And so that's how they're going to move. And you got to understand that. Now, in this distance, this also may mean you change churches. Your church is not the only place God resides. So if you truly had a situation that is that was really something, it did a number on you and you really need to heal, you're going to have to change churches. If y'all work together, you're going to have to change jobs or get transferred to another department or to another location so that you don't see your ex. A lot of times people say, you know, people have asked me countless times, Tony, I broke up with my ex, but we work together. So I see them every day. Okay. Your job got other locations. You got to get a transfer. What you do at your job, your skill set could work at another job. You got to get a new job because you have to think about it differently. It's like, let's say you play with your nose. Okay. You know what I'm talking When I say play with your nose, I'm talking about that. Okay. Let's say you play with your nose. Okay. You snort your little something. And that right there is addicting. You've seen people who own that. Well, if they going into work every day or coming, if they come in their house every day and it's, if it's a line right there on the table because they live with their sister, brother, they husband, wife, whoever, they roommate, and the roommate ain't ready to stop playing with their nose. They keep, <sighs> and so you walking past that every day. How do you think someone who has been uh, uh, to that going to get over that if they looking at it every day that's the same way the mind works when you looking at your ex every day so you gonna have to i have i remember having a, a client who her ex um is a music artist who owned the radio had another client who her ex is a actor who always on billboards and always in a movie Guess what? You got to stop looking at billboards. You got to stop listening to the radio. You got to put your CD in. You got to stop watching TV. You got to watch Netflix. And unless you got something on Netflix, now you got to go to Hulu. Netflix, Hulu, Simichat. And so you have to do something different. My client who her ex sang a uh, song R&B, I said, uh, you got to listen to country. You're going to have to listen to country. You're going to have to listen to gospel. You got to get distance because if you don't get, then I remember, I remember so many clients that I have talked to, that I have coached. If they had a trigger that reminds them of their ex, I, I would be coaching somebody and they would say, and they would say on the call, I can't get over my ex. I, I'm still feeling like he or she was the one. I miss him or her. It's just so hard to get over them. And so, okay, I'm getting ready to go into the work. We're getting ready to do the work, like what we talk about on this video. And then the next thing I know, it come up. Next thing I know, they say that the ex, that they've been broken up for three years. And I'm like, huh? Three years? And you still stuck? I think the longest I done heard one time was, well, it could have been more than one time, but the longest I think I done heard is seven or eight years. And you could imagine, I, you know, at that point, I'm, I'm literally about to fall out. But it could be my personality where I don't understand it personally, but this is humans. Some humans are like that. And it's just because they continue to look at the pictures. They continue to listen to the voicemail. They continue to 
be friends with their friend or family. They continue to be connected, be associated. And so with that, it's like, how can you heal? How can you grow? If you, How can you get over this person? You still connected like that. And so you have to get distance. Now, what I want you to do is because I'm doing this without notes. I'm doing this without a, a bullet point notes. I have my three points, but I don't have the subcategories. And so you got to sit down and you got to think of other ways that you get distance that applies to this situation. Don't just take exactly what I'm saying. You know, you lay this out for you. Because get distance, it may be a total different example for you. It may be like, it may be much more complicated. And so you have to be creative with what you do. So like if you have someone you have a child with, then what you may have to do is you may have to have your mother be the drop off and pick up person. So that you don't have to see your ex. Your mother is the go-between. Or your best friend is well, no, nah, don't do don't do your best friend. Nah. Don't do your best friend. Your best friend be, be getting laid down, be getting wore out. And they, they bite toe out of frame by your ex. And male or female. Don't 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 do best friend. Do your mama. Then uh, some of y'all, nah. Now, some of y'all mamas, I done seen a couple mamas on the news sleeping with they with their daughter, man, or or or, or like the like that one mom who her daughter is not married to her ex. The mama says she used to sleep with this man. Now this man done married the woman daughter. Imagine that. And so you have to. Take what I'm saying and you got to be able to apply it to your situation. Just pretend that your situation is somebody else's situation and you're on the outside looking in. And now you prescribe it based on what needs to be done. A lot of times we can help other people, but we can't help ourselves. So when it's yourself that needs the help, you got to step outside and look in as if you're looking into somebody else's situation. And so think about that. And then, or you could write the scenario down for your friend and have your friend call you and y'all role play. Let your friend tell you so you could hear it like it's their problem. And that'll help you also see what you need to do. You got to step outside yourself and look in now. So this distance can mean a lot of different things. And sometimes distance will not be able to be completely not seeing or not talking to, not hearing from. Sometimes distance means just minimizing the interaction. Sometimes distance means instead of talking every day, you talk once a week. Sometimes distance is instead of not receiving a call, you receive a call, but it's your child who answered the phone to talk to their mother or father about how they're doing instead of you answering the phone to talk to your ex. So sometimes it's just minimizing. Sometimes it's you stay at the same church, but if you know your ex go to the 11 o'clock service, then you got to hit that 8 o'clock service. If you know your ex work on Saturdays, then you got to hit that Saturday 5 p.m. service. Some churches have that or some of them don't. So you got, you got to minimize it. It may mean if you can't change jobs, changing shifts. If you can't change jobs or shift, change departments. You see what I mean? Or come early or come, you know, right on time. Leave a little early or leave a little later. So open your mind and stretch this thing out and make it work for you to where you get as much distance as you possibly can. You may not be able to get completely away. And that's one thing that just really drives me crazy when I'm teaching something like this and then somebody asks a question that just takes a little bit more application, just take a little bit more thinking out of the box to make it fit for you. You got to realize when I'm doing these videos, I can't think of 400 million, I mean, 7 billion examples. We got 7 billion people in the world. 
So I'm not going to be able to hit on every single scenario. So you got to sit down and you got to process this for yourself and come up with a strategy to help you. And that's what's going to get you really where you got to go. Now, step number two is to feel it. You've heard, um, now I don't know if, well, minds think alike, but um, I think Jay-Z got this for me and tried to, tried to credit his mama for this here. On, he said it on the album. But I don't know how he said it. But you cannot heal it unless you admit that you feel it. That's a quote I sent out years ago, probably 2009, 2010. You cannot heal it unless you admit that you feel it. And um, this is something that came to me from a story that Tony Dungy told. Tony Dungy was a football coach. And he told the story of his son not having pain sensors, like the part of his brain that senses pain did not work. And forgive me if I'm telling the story wrong because I don't know if it was an actual son or not. But, and so what he would say is that his son would go and they'll like have some cookies baking and they'll open the oven to get the cookies and some just come in there, whoosh, dive in their hand first. Whatever he wanted, he'll just, he'll grab it out of a hot pan, hot oven, you know, touch hot stuff and his hand would burn, but he couldn't feel it. And because he couldn't feel it, because the pain sensors in his brain did not work, it wouldn't heal. It would take way longer for it to heal, two, three times as much time for it to heal because he couldn't feel it. And so the moral of that message that Tony Dundee gave was pain is a healing agent. And from that is where I come up with the quote, you cannot heal it unless you admit that you feel it. Now, what I'm talking about, I, I wasn't talking about his son's situation because his son couldn't admit that he feel nothing because he couldn't feel it. But I'm talking to adults who, instead of us running through the pain, we run away from the pain. See, I got another quote I posted that said, when you can't get over it, and you can't get under it, and you can't get around it, you have to go through it. And so you have to understand that when you are hurting, you got to hurt. You got to hurt. So you, if you need to cry, you need to cry. If you need to sign up for boxing lessons and you got to punch that bag, sign up for boxing lessons and punch that bag. If you can't sleep for three nights and you got to take some melatonin, take some melatonin. If if you got to do some stretching and some breathing and some some spa music, classical music, whatever it may be, do what you have to do. But you got to feel it. And the reason why you got to feel it is so you can heal it, because the way the brain works is the brain wants to heal and the brain wants to soothe. So when you having some issues, some trauma, some pain, if you notice from some of the most traumatic situations come the most beautiful creations, meaning the people who have faced the most opposition sometimes go on to create the most beautiful things in, in, in the world. The people who have, who make something of themselves a lot of those people have a story to tell. And it's not a situation where they're like, hey, you know, I grew up. I lived on a hill, on this hill. I was on my hill. I lived on a hill and we had a thousand cattle. We had a thousand mules. We had a thousand goats, a thousand donkeys. We lived on 200 acres. We had this amazing picket fence that went around. I had a maid. I had a chef. You really don't hear that story from someone who has become great. You rarely, you never hear this, this perfect, beautiful story. 
When somebody become great, when you hear their story, what you hear is adversity on average. You hear pain, you hear struggle. Even if they come up in, you know, a wealthy household, it was dad was this like this. Mom was like this. Dad did this to mom. It's this other stuff. They was alone all the time. Parents was too busy working or, you know, all this other stuff. And so, and from that, they had to focus, lock in, and then start to create. So I was reading about the brother, um, Tyler Perry, and he was talking about how he wrote, he just went away and he wrote for seven TV shows or seven hours or seven something, seven series or something. And how later in the future he gonna give it away, but he was talking about how he don't get writer's block because when he grew up in pain and trauma and abuse, that writing was his escape. So now he don't get writer's block. And so, and look what this man has created and listen to his story. You see what I mean? And so I say that to say, not to say that his work is a man, a man, amazing or impeccable you know to each their own like hey it's more than what we doing so I, I wouldn't mind trading places with them to do me some of that right and get me some of the millions he making you see what i'm saying but that comes from he birthed that from pain and so i say that to say when you look around and you start to see stories even maybe your own story you will notice that you felt it and you felt every part of it and you went through it. So you, you cried, you struggled, you worried, you stressed, you missed nights of sleep, like you went through it. So if you go through it and you feel it and you allow yourself to feel it, guess what? You will not, uh, you will not feel on day 70, the way you felt on day seven, you will feel worse on day 70 than you did on day seven. If you don't allow yourself to feel it, if you just running from it by just staying busy, you blasting music, you drinking, you doing uh, you doing all different kind of stuff. You doing all this stuff, then you messing yourself up because you're not processing it. And you're not allowing it to, to, to come through it. I remember I went through a situation as an adult. Uh, I didn't go through much as a child. I, I really didn't go through much as a child. And so I can't really speak to that. And what I went through as an adult was not that traumatic either. But I remember I went through a situation and I felt like a failure. I felt like a failure. I felt like... Man, I was positioned, but I wasn't prepared. And I dropped the ball and I fell. And I felt like I wasn't good enough. I felt like I, I did it all wrong. I made too many mistakes. And I'm like, come on, Tony. You weren't good enough, man. And that's how I felt. And so feeling like that, I was like, it was keeping me up at night. And I was, and I just, I would, it would keep me up at night, two or three o'clock in the morning. It would wake me up out of the night. I go to sleep and I wake up having a nightmare. If I rolled over, if I had to get up and go urinate, if anything woke me up, I would not be able to go back to sleep. Like the way I do now, if I'm up late because I don't work a, a regular job, if I'm up late, if I don't have to get up, I get up, go urinate, come back to the bed and put on, let something play like on YouTube, like some boxing stuff, weigh-ins and different stuff boxing matches do. I let it play on YouTube to sub distract my subconscious mind and then I'll fall back to sleep and I'll go back to sleep to 8. If I wake up again, I ain't got to get up, I'll sleep to 9 a.m., I'll sleep to 10 a.m., I do what I what my body requires me to do. I don't try to stick on nobody's schedule. Oh, got to get up 5 o'clock every morning. 
No, I'm going to do what my body is telling me to do. I'm going to listen to my body. But when I was going through, I would, I'd be up. I'd be up. It'll wake me up. I can't go back to sleep. And guess what? So this situation was like maybe 2016 or something like that. We in 2021. So now I'm talking to you about this. And I don't feel anything for it. Like, I don't feel any anxiety. I don't feel a sense of failure. I don't feel nothing. Like, my, my brain has processed it. I've processed it. I've healed from it. And I'm like, you know what, Tony? You're not a failure. And I've made sense of it. And the mind makes sense. The mind remembers things better than it actually was so in our mind we are uh, my, my niece just sent me a thing today from uh pope hoops and i'll be telling the story about basketball you know i was always top five in my county she just sent me a thing from my 11th grade year i wouldn't need top i wouldn't need top 10 i'm like oh i was an honorable mention I was an honorable mention. Hey, I ain't remember that. I ain't remember it like that. Now, hold on. Honorable mention? In the 11th grade? Honorable mention? Is that the same Tony Gaskin? I, I thought I was top five, but I was top five in my sophomore year. My junior year, we had another player come to the school. And he was ball dominant. He used to like the ball in his hand. And the coach used to like the ball in his hand because he just made layups. So it was high percentage shots. And so the coach liked that too. So when I went from averaging by 18, I went down to averaging 11. But in my mind, I still was top five. So when I tell the story, I was always top five. When I seen that, I'm like, hold on, honorable men. <laughs> So you see what I'm saying? We remember things. That's why you see people who have gone through some things when they were younger and you talk to them now and they tell you the whole story without crying. They're not crying over it. They they writing a book about it. They doing a tour about it. And you'll think like, well, did it feel good? Like, did you enjoy it? Like the way you touring and the way you talking, like you, you act like you happy that happened to you. And so that's the way the mind works. The mind processes things and it wants to self-soothe. And so now you asking me right now, Tony, where you learn this from? Where you get this from? You a therapist? You uh, all this right here? No, I study life. I study life. I study people. And I just report the facts. I ain't coming to you from a book I read. I study people, my finger on the pulse. I'm not sitting in the classroom reading books and taking tests to get nobody certification. I'm studying real life people. And I study myself to understand myself as a human, knowing that I'm not an alien. So if I could understand me, that let me know I could better understand you because we both humans. Now, if you was an alien, I really can't speak to you about what it's like and what it's, how you're going to heal and all that because you're an alien or if I was an alien. But being a human, I understand that human nature, it's, going, it's only going to be one of a few different ways, so to speak. Now, it's going to be a million scenarios, but it, our brains work the same. And your brain wants to process and to heal and to give you a narrative, to give you an explanation for what you went through to give you what you need to keep moving forward. And so understand that. Now, somebody probably didn't come up with a term for it, but understand that. And when you do that and you start to work on yourself in that way, now you're getting ready to make some real moves. Now, step number three would be get new knowledge. Get new knowledge. So what you're doing right now, you're getting knowledge. But you understanding, you watching this video, so you learning a few steps that you have to take to heal from a breakup, but getting new knowledge, that's going to be a whole lot of stuff. It's a lot that's going to come with that. 
that getting new knowledge. So when I say get new knowledge, that really means that you are you studying men. You studying men and you learning men. So you you watching YouTube videos, you reading books, you taking online courses and you learning men. You studying women. You watching YouTube videos, you reading books, and you taking online courses, you and you looking at real life. On both of these, you look at real life. Like look at every family member you know, every coworker you know, every friend, colleague, constituent, associate, every person you know. Look at these people and evaluate them inside and out. Evaluate them. You're not judging them. You're evaluating them. You're looking at and you're seeking to understand them. This is going to help you better understand people. You connecting struggle with their story. You connecting past with their present. So you getting an understanding of human beings. And what you're going to do in this, in your own work, the work that I've done, this is the work that I'm trying to tell you to do, is you're going to see. So I was, I was with a friend today for lunch and we were talking about interracial relationships. And I broke down to him the different types of interracial relationships from my understanding from what I've seen. And out of those few different types, I have not seen any more than that. As many interracial relationships I've looked at, they fit into those, uh, I think it was two or four categories that I laid out to him. They fit in every single one I look at. They fit inside of one of those categories. And so every new one that I see, I will study it and I will see what cat if it fits in one of these categories. If it doesn't, then I put it in a new category. The same thing when I see a man. If I see a man and he online and he got a message for women, I'm going to study that and I'm going to see Okay, two-parent home, one-parent home. Athlete, ladies' man, or quiet, introvert, overlooked by women. Socially distant, or whatever you would call it. I don't like the term socially awkward, because just because that's a person, personality don't, don't mean they're awkward. You know, just because they're quiet don't mean they're awkward. And so this is another thing we got to think about our words and how we label people. That's why I also don't want to say nerdy because that's also a derogatory term. Even though some people who consider them, some people call themselves nerdy, just embracing it. Just like some black people use the N word, which is the most ignorant thing that we do. But, but I don't want to use those words. And one another thing I hate when people do is say, oh, that's retarded. And it's like, okay, retarded is a, is a real thing. It's the real mental condition. So we shouldn't label somebody doing something the wrong way or somebody doing something we don't like as retarded. See, we got to be conscious. This is a part of learning yourself too. Be conscious of your words and what you're saying. Now, me talking off the top of my dome for an hour, trust and believe, I done said a whole lot that I wish I could take back, but I'll just be flowing. And so sometimes you just, you speaking from where you are, you speaking from what you've heard. And if you haven't got to that place and addressed it, then you're going to struggle. And sometimes you're going to do stuff in the, I wish I could take back that video I did on Sunday where I was crunk, but I said, you know what? That was me. That was authentic. I'm going to leave it up. I, don't, I, I, I regret saying some of the stuff I said, but hey, I'll just show my growth or different approaches in other videos but that's also a side of me that's a part of me and i want to be authentic and so this is what you're doing in this new knowledge you paying attention you look at this woman here and you'll see this woman who she got what society says is a perfect body you see her hair color you see her outfit she wears you and you and you look and you look into her past and you get an understanding, okay, does her past correlate to her present? 
Is she a product of her environment? You see this other woman and her body may be the complete opposite. You look at her present, you go into her past, you see what, what she's dealt with, what she's been through. So you have one woman who, both of these women, when you go into their past, both of them could have been touched as a child. But for one, she started to act outwardly and use her body and her looks to get what she wanted in the world. And the other one, she went inward and she started to do harm to herself by overeating or, you know, just finding other self-soothing mechanisms. And so both went through the same type of thing, but it shows up differently in their life. And so as you study in people in the same with men, you see one man over here, and let's say it. Like in my space, relationship coach, you see me over here and I'm in my style. And then you see another man over here and he's in his style. But when you go into our history, you may see one man. It was a two parent household, Christian two parent household. Another man was a single parent household with no religious beliefs or a religious foundation. And you see one man could have been, you know, about the ladies all about the ladies and another man could have been introverted and kind of overlooked. So one man could be, could have been the jock and one man could have been no sports. And so, or the athlete, we want to say jock, cause that could be derogatory to some people like the term meathead. And so athlete, non-athlete or sports, no sports because it could be athletic and just don't want to play sports. But when you look at this and then you see, I saw a man say before, he said, a history plus the biography equals the makeup of the man. And honestly, that's common sense, but we just don't think about it like that. My phone getting ready to go dead. We just don't think about it like that often. And so this is something you got to think about. And I want you to process this and start to get this new knowledge. And see, the thing, what a lot of people do what a lot of people do wrong is they consider new knowledge as just as books and courses and all those things. And I mentioned those things, but new knowledge could be because I've gone on. I've seen therapists page and they're not saying anything different than I'm saying. And I never took a single one of their classes that they've taken. I don't have the degree that they have. But the same stuff they teaching that they went and got a master's degree in is the same stuff I'm teaching from studying myself and the lives of the people I come in contact with. And then what I come to realize is the reason why we hitting on the same stuff and the reason why it's countless therapists today adding life coaching to their resume, to their offerings and as countless coaches, I mean, therapists today taking my life coach certification program is because they realize they don't want to be confined by a treatment plan. They want to be able to use life's wisdom as well and not have to worry about being audited, which a therapist could use life wisdom too, but you also, you, you slip up, you get audited and lose your license. As a life coach, there is no license. There is no regulating board. A lot of people come and always, hey, is your course accredited? There is no accreditation in life coaching because there's no regulating board. It's not backed by the government. So I could go get accredited from this company or I can start the company that does the accreditation and neither one of them will mean anything because the government is the one who say yay or nay, and they don't care about life coaching right now. They let you do what you want to do as a life coach until the stuff hit the fan. And if stuff hit the fan, now you got a price to pay. But the way the government look at it is like, that's your life wisdom that you helping somebody with. That, and if somebody want to be, you know, respectful enough to pay you, some I was some people respectful enough. Some people could 
be gullible enough because some people don't know what they're talking about and just getting over on people for money. And then some people really have passion and really doing it from the right place. And so somebody see that value. So the government says somebody want to pay you for your time and for your value to listen to them and to work with them based on your life experience, go right ahead. But what they saying is, if now if you want to take and use a treatment plan and you want to be able to prescribe medicine and you want to be able to diagnose, you're going to need some certification. Playboy, because somebody go hop off a bridge after talking to you. Yeah, we need to come for that license and we need to lock you up. You see what I mean? So it's a difference. But what I realize is we saying the same stuff and I will come on here and I will explain something that I've seen. And I'm going to give you a prime example. I explain men, just average everyday men. I'm not explaining this, this rare man. And do you know, it'll be so many people come into the comments of the videos about grown boys. And they say, Tony, you describing a narcissist. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm describing nine out of 10 men. Somebody else came up with a term for that. And they and some women will say, Tony, that's not common. What you're describing is a narcissist and narcissists are not that common. And I'm like, listen to this woman. Probably had one relationship her whole life and come trying to tell me about the men that I done been around my entire life Nine out of 10 men in a locker room of 95 men, nine out of 10 men is what I'm describing as a grown boy. And this woman trying to tell me this is rare. And I'm describing a narcissist. And that's the thing. The people who wrote the books for psychology class, God didn't write the book. Somebody just like you wrote the book. And you know what they did? They studied human psychology. They studied humans. They did tests. They did surveys. And from that, they created a textbook. And they put it in the school system. But you are the textbook. You are the person that was being studied. So if when you get new knowledge, if you could understand you and why you do what you do, why you say what you say, why you act the way you act, let me help you understand something. Let me help you understand something. I have nice things. I have nice things. I have nice cars. I have nice watches. I have nice clothes. And I like those things. I like those things because of the quality. Now I understand the quality of it. So I appreciate the quality. But let me tell you why I first got those things. The reason why I first got those things is because I'm a black man in America. And as a black man in America, what I have found from my existence, from my life, the only time I get respect from men of another race or really respect from men of any race is when they see that my watch costs more than theirs and or that my car costs more than theirs. So if I pull up to the mall in my car, they say, I'm going to leave your car right here in the front. If I pull up in a different kind of car, a car, just a, a everyday car, an average everyday car, the valet, even though in this car and this car, we paying the same thing, my, my nice car, they're going to leave it in the front. This other car, the Camry, the Honda, I used to have an Altima, I used to have an Impala, I used to have a Maxima, no, an Altima, and I had an Impala, and my wife had a Honda Civic. They're going to go park, though. They're going to go park, though. Now, I could pull up in this other car, and let's say a Bentley. That Bentley could be from fraud. It, that Bentley could be from credit card fraud, from scamming, from anything. And guess what? They're going to leave that Bentley up there in the front. 
because they feel like if you have reached this level of success in life to be able to get this car, you deserve, you are a special person and you deserve special treatment. Now, how backwards is that? When somebody could be worth millions and pull up in a Toyota Corolla and they finna make this multi-millionaire or this billionaire wait on their car because they finna go park it at the top level of the parking garage. And now when they come, when this billionaire, this millionaire come back out there, they got to stand there and wait for these people to go get their car. When their time is worth way more than the person in the Bentley who account could be empty. But because they took and bought a thing, a material thing, they get more respect and better treatment. Do you know the more money you have, the less money you got to spend on things because people want to give you stuff? because you are already successful, because they admire your success, they wanna brush shoulders with your success, and they wanna give you stuff, because they saying, I wanna invest on good ground. I wanna sow on good ground, and because there's some fertile ground right here. I don't wanna sow on what they assume is stony ground. But what they don't realize, this person could just not value a, a car. They could just not value cars. They they like why spend why get a three hundred thousand dollar car when a thirty thousand dollar car will do the same thing. Get me A to B, and I'm gonna feel just the same inside this thirty thousand as I'm gonna feel inside this three hundred thousand dollar car. It's just they value different things. But the person who can afford three hundred thousand dollar car and choose to get a thirty thousand dollar car, they may want to buy a three hundred thousand dollar robot. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. People are going to spend their money. But see how I'm studying human beings. So Warren Buffett may have his same Cadillac from 1999. He may live in the same house. But if he got a $5 billion hotel in Italy, it's like, okay, then all right. He still spent money. And then he may not want to get material stuff, but guess what? He can't take that money with him. So when he kick the bucket and he go to see the Lord, if he going to see the Lord, who finna get all that money? Who did not think about, who did not earn it, who did not sacrifice, who did not read them 500 pages a day he say he read, who didn't do none of the work he did, they finna be left a whole lot of money. Somebody finna be left some money, even if it's a nonprofit organization who claim to be doing good work. That CEO finna get paid out off of Warren Buffett sacrifice. You see what I'm saying? The money gonna get spent. So you have to study people and you're gonna learn the different variations of how people move. So now it's gonna help you understand people. So now you can see a spirit from a mile away because you done got the knowledge. Because you you shut your mouth, you shut your mouth, and you open your eyes, you open your ears, and you watch people. So now you see where people operating from. You see where they operating from, and you're able to, oh, okay, uh-huh, uh-huh, so you this type. And now in your mind, you're going to become your own psychologist, your own therapist, your own psychiatrist, because you're going to be like, okay, this type of person, or I'm going to put you right here in this category. You meet somebody else, they go in that same category. Meet somebody else, they go in that same category. You meet somebody else, okay, mm, you different. You, you go in this category. Meet somebody else, they go in that category. Meet somebody else, oh, they're a different category. And then what you're going to find, you typically going to find three to five type, three to five categories that people fit into. So when studying myself, I said, Tony, you buy material things. At first, before I understood that there was a difference in quality, I bought material things for respect. See, I had to be honest about that, but I also paid attention. When I pulled up, I rented a Bentley one time in Miami and it was $1,000 for one day. When I pulled up, 
I, I wasn't no millionaire. I barely had any money. But I wanted to splurge because I was in Miami with my wife, my son, and her sister-in-law was down there in med school. And I wanted to stunt. And it was a drop top. And I paid $1,000 from a concierge guy down there who rent out luxury cars. And he just get the car, bring it to you, just Venmo or cash out $1,000. It wasn't cash out back then. But I had to send $1,000 somehow. And no, no license or anything, you know. And so it's a little concierge. And it was also my brand. So here I am, broke and can't afford no Bentley at that time. But because of my brand online, he saw me differently. He saw me differently. I had bad credit and everything. But he saw me differently. You see what I'm saying? So I stu by studying this, human nature has, has let me see this. And so when he brought me the car, when we, when we pull up to our hotel, the guy say, oh, wow. One of the guys like, what do you do? I'm an author. Now he think authors make Bentley money. I wasn't making Bentley money. He think authors make Bentley money. I'm an author and a speaker. Wow. People ask you what you do. Don't nobody ask me what I do when I had my Altima. And not a soul asked me what do I do when I had my Altima. So what's going on now? So I'm learning a lesson about human nature. Sir, I'm going to leave your car up here in the front. That's a true story, what I'm telling you. Try it out one day. Rent you a luxury car. Rent you a luxury car one day when you get, when, and, and just to do a human experiment. Buy you a pair or rent you a pair or get you a used pair of red bottoms if you're a woman and sit down in the nail salon and kick that foot up the way them people know it and they know what that red bottom mean you finna get treated totally different than the one with the black bottom and the tan bottom because they're gonna say oh she's special she got tilt money oh yes um yes um, have you been helped oh uh, yes i'm um, so yeah how can i help you and my wife told me about this my wife told me about this because I done bought her nice jewelry. And she told me, she said, I get, she said, I was in the store. She said, I'm in the store. And she said, you know, I be looking like a bomb. She said, I'm dressed like a bomb. And she said, the lady look at me. The lady look at me, don't say a word. And she said, I'm right over there. I'm looking at the clothes. The lady don't say a word. She said, a little while later, I pulled my sleeve up. Pulled my sleeve up. My wife got a Rolex and she got three Cartier bracelets and she got a diamond tennis bracelet. She said, when I pull my sleeve up, the, the hoodie, the right there, she said, I just pulled it up just because I was hot. She said, that lady looked over and seen my wrist. She said, maybe that lady darted over there so fast. Oh, yes, how are you? Hey, yes, have you been helped? Oh, my goodness. I didn't even see you. I'm so busy. How, what's going on? Oh, yes, well, how can I help you? This real true life story. You hear me? And so when you studying people to get new knowledge, now when you get into another relationship, when you sit down with this person, you can grab your teeth and throw that pinky out. You can cross your legs. I can't even cross my legs. You can cross your legs and just have your conversation. You ain't got to be anxious. You ain't got no anxiety. You ain't got no nervousness. You ain't worried about nothing because you done sat and you done studied human beings so much, so closely for a whole year, whole six months, that when you sit down with this person, you finna know in 30 minutes. See how I'm trying to cross this leg? Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Okay. And so now how did that make you feel? When you get done 30 minutes later, you're going to know everything you need to know about this person. You're going to know exactly, okay, this is a Jezebel spirit, this is a Delilah spirit, this is a Ruth spirit, this is a Esther spirit, this is a King David spirit, this is a Solomon spirit. You're going to know who you sitting in front of. And you're going to have a category that you could put them in based on your studies. Okay, you are this hill type person. 
What you think that enogram is? God ain't make an enogram. God ain't make an enogram. A human made an enogram. The enogram test or whatever, the personality test. People are so, people so enamored with this stuff. With these personality tests. People so enamored with astrology, with horoscope. This is human work. That's not God's work. That's humans' work. That's humans studying. They just studying. They just taking their time and they just getting new knowledge. So a lot of time people, they come and they just all over the place. And it, like, it just take a season of silence. It take a season of just being quiet and just listening. Just paying attention, just watching, just talking. I grew up near by the mute. My mama used to say to me, Tony, she used to say to me, Tony, pick your head up. People going to think you dumb. And I used to be like, okay, what? My goodness, I just found a diamond ring. I don't feel like looking at y'all humans. Find me a diamond ring. And uh, and frankly, woman, this is what I'm thinking in my head. Frankly, woman, I don't care who, what nobody thinks. I don't want to talk to y'all. I grew up extremely quiet. I was with my business partner, who was my friend as well, his father. My business partner owns a hotel. And so the man who brought the hotel idea and plans to him, uh, he was with us. They also own or the you know leading family on the build out of a park that's on 300 acres the man who's running that he was with us and then his classmate cuz he two grades under me behind me his classmate who owns a big company in two different states was with us so in this car it was it was a few billion in this car. And so we ride and I'm driving. I opted to drive. Be the humble servant. Now, it's only two people in that car who make more than me. So I could have sat back in the back. No, I, I offered to drive. And nobody didn't fight me for it. It showed me something about human nature. On the way coming back, nobody said, hey, Tony, you drove over here. Uh, I, I got it on the way going back. Nobody said a word. I drove us back. It was an hour plus there, an hour plus back. I could have kicked back. You see what I'm saying? But I didn't. See, I'm studying humans. I'm going the extra mile. And while we was riding on the way back, it was another man. He's uh, Haitian, I believe. So me and him, the only two blacks in there, but he from a different culture. Um, I was born in America and he had an accent, you know, and he said, well, uh, Mr. Tony, you are a man of few words. And so he noticed that I was quiet. And on the way over there, he noticed I was quiet. And he probably, and, and what he didn't realize is I've been knowing this family way longer than he have. But I'm just not a talkative person. I don't care to be the center of attention. I don't care to talk. I speak when spoken to. And when I talk, I talk for a reason. I talk with a purpose. Like what I'm doing right now. This is to set somebody free. Somebody boohoo crying. Somebody stressing. They struggling. These few, these three steps is to set somebody free. Somebody who done got to this point in this message. They needed to get to this point in this message. And even the random stuff I done touched on, they needed that random stuff. But I speak with a purpose and for a purpose. And so my partner said he actually talks more than anybody in this car. He just does it online. And when you multiply it by the amount of people who listen to it, his voice is infinite. That's what he said. And so he understand that about me. And he know that I'm quiet. I'm shy. I'm reserved. I'm an introvert, but I speak with a purpose, for a purpose. And so because I'm quiet, 
it allowed me to study people. So when I look at somebody, I can read their whole life story. I could read somebody's whole life story by looking at them. And the reason what I the reason why I could do that is because I spent decades being quiet. And I studied people. And I created categories. And I realized that nine out of ten times, you're gonna fit in one of these categories that I didn't already put in place. That nine out of ten times, based on how you act, how you dress, and how you carry yourself. I can tell you what you went through growing up because I done studied thousands of people. And so this is the same way. This is what we fail to realize. This is the same way our psychology book, people are coming here. Uh, yes, I'm a psychology major. And so what this really is, and it's like you, you reporting from a book that your comprehension skills may be failing you in reading the book. Just because you read the book don't mean you understand what you read. You see what I'm saying? So just because you went to college don't make you better than nobody. Especially somebody that then took the time to study humans for themselves versus letting someone else study humans and then write about them in a textbook and then taking what that person said as gospel. So what I'm telling you is get new knowledge. So where I have the term grown boy, I created that term. Now somebody, oh, my grandma said that. No, she didn't. And if she did, she didn't mean the same thing. And, and, and if she did, then guess what? Our mind just wired the same. Like they say, minds think alike. They say great minds think alike, but I don't want to call my mind great. Minds think alike. Some minds think alike. So guess what? Ain't nothing new under the sun, but you got to do the work for you. Because my work ain't going to get you through. My work ain't going to do nothing for you. You got to do the work for you. So I had to heal for me. You got to heal for you. So where I say a grown boy, in your process and you thinking and you planning and mapping, you may come up with something else. Another term that we've heard somebody else say man child they not that's different than a grown boy when they say man child that's a sports term for a kid who is six foot six in the eighth grade they call him man child you see what i mean and so you might come up with pamper man and that mean a grown man who act like a baby you see how i just come up with that and then when you say pamper man, pamper man literally could be the title for a best-selling New York Times best-selling book. And it goes down in history as a label that describes a grown man who act like a baby. You see what I'm saying? So that's why when people come to me and Tony, what do you think about twin flames? And Tony, what do you think about love bombing? And Tony, what do you think about narcissists? And Tony, what... I don't think nothing about none of that because that's somebody term that they pulled out of thin air based on their experiences and that's on their studies. And when they, and even with narcissism, people say it comes from uh narcissus or what the, the Greek, the Greek thing, the Greek mythology, narcissist. Or whatever, whatever the thing name was. So the person who come up with narcissist couldn't even be original to come up with another word. They made a word based on somebody else's imagination, which is Greek mythology. You see what I'm saying? So just like with Zeus and all this other Greek mythology, that stuff has went through and permeated the whole world. Somebody imagination has named TV networks, apps, companies, somebody imagination because the person who named or came up with this term was not creative enough. They essentially looked at Greek mythology and they said, okay, well, what was this person?
what was this person uh, the term narcissism this is what Google say which could be wrong and originated from the Roman poet Ovid's Metamorphosis book three in the first century story of Narcissus and Echo and much later evolved into a highly specialized psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic term. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Do you hear what I just told you? But see, people will come on my page and get in my comments and want to go back and forth and argue with me. And I'm going to tell you why. Because America has made black equivalent to ignorant. America has made a college degree the standard for human validation. So that if you don't have a degree and if you are black, there's no possible way you could know what you're talking about. And then third, I'm a male. Males are so vile and so foul in the way that we treat women and the way that we operate. The world want to see men burned at the stake for the things that we have done. So being non-degree holding, black and male, it gives certain people a disposition. And this is where the question comes from. Where did you learn all this from? What are your credentials? My credentials is the breath in my body and the life that I have lived. And guess what your credentials are? The same thing. Because guess what the credentials of the person who wrote the textbook, the people who wrote the textbook that you read, guess what their credentials are? The same as yours. Living breathing and paying attention to what's going on around them. You see what I'm trying to tell you? You don't have to. Now, now look at this now. And then here come. When did the term narcissistic originate? Narcissism, pathological self-absorption, first identified as a mental disorder by the British essayist and physician Havelock Ellis in 1898. So do it sound like a British essayist and physician in 1898 probably read the Roman poet Ovid's Metamorphosis book three? Do it sound like he's the type of person that would read something like that? You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? And so he took and studied a poet. And, and see here, I'm talking about um, Greek mythology. I don't know if the man was, if that was Greek. Well, they say Roman. You see what I mean? Because that's what somebody told me. Now, all this could be wrong. And then this is what people come and, this is what people come and do. This is what we do as humans. We come and report what Google told us. People will come and say, oh, Christianity, the Holy Bible wasn't, ain't real. The Holy Bible, this and that, the Holy Bible. Because if you read this sacred text, it'll let you know. I said, hold on now. So you reading a, you reading a sacred text and yours right. But I'm reading the Holy Bible and mine's wrong. So what make your sacred text right and mine wrong? But hold on, but hold on though. But hold on. But hold on. See, you talking about textbooks. Let's compare lives. What's, what's your peace like? <clears throat> I 
What your wholeness like? <clears throat> Where your goals at? What your dreams like? How many of them have you accomplished? Mm. Mm. Okay. So you arguing with me about my beliefs, but my beliefs get results. Okay. In a discussion. See, I don't want to hear nothing about no fairy tale. I don't want to hear nothing about no labels. I don't want to hear nothing about none of that. I want to hear about what does life, what is life teaching you? What is life showing you? Because all of our comprehension is going to fail us. What have you learned from your life? Now we talking. Now, what term based on your vocabulary? Don't use don't, don't, don't just settle for Ovid's metamorphosis uh, vocabulary. Don't just settle for uh, Havelock Ellis vocabulary. What do your vocabulary? So see, based on my vocabulary, because I ain't read the books that these, hip, that these hip folks read or that they wrote. I ain't read it. And I... Um, this here... Ovids, um, what was 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 Greek mythology before him, or did Greek mythology come from him? He Roman did did the Greek taking still off of him and create their character based on what he wrote as a poet. And now listen now, this term that we using is said to come from a poet. This ain't this ain't this not a doctor. But this is an artist, somebody who studied life and was in their head, in their imagination and writing. Now, this is a clinical diagnosis that everybody on online, that everybody online think they fully understand inside and out. You see what I'm saying? You have to know for you. So when you healing, you got to shut your mouth and you got to study. Don't just don't just depend on the books and the courses and the YouTube. Yeah, you get those things in you. Then you got to do your studies. You got to study people. You got to listen to people. You got to look at people. You got to watch people. You got to look at their present. You got to look at their past. You see what I mean? Then you put it all together and then you're going to say, oh, mm. based on my vocabulary, I'm going to call this a self-absorptionist. Mm. I'm going to call this a absorptionist. Now, you could be describing the same thing to somebody else. What I call a grown boy, people come tell me, Tony, you describing a narcissist. Before I even knew what a narcissist was, before I had ever heard the word, I just heard that word like two years ago. But I was describing every man that I've ever met in my life. Every man that I've ever met in my life is what I was describing. And then countless people come to tell me, Tony, you describing a narcissist. No, I'm not describing a narcissist. I'm describing a grown boy. Because the person who come up with that word, I don't fully know what they meant by that word. And so I'm not going to take somebody else's definition and apply it to what I've seen in life. I'm going to come up with my own word because I because my definition is going to be different slightly than this other person's definition. So I'm not finna just use labels and go by labeling people. So when you living and you doing, you got to come up with your own words. It's okay to have this stuff as a basis. It's okay to have this stuff as a reference. But when you don't seek truth for yourself in your life based on your experiences, based on your results, then you will be boxed in to somebody else's definition. But oftentimes when you speak to the author of a word and they explain to you out of their mouth what it really means, you say, oh, you weren't even talking to me. You were talking about something totally different. 
You weren't even talking about a lover. You were talking about a, a dad. You were talking about a mom. You were talking about an animal. Oh my goodness. I didn't know you were studying the bear. I thought you were talking about a, a man. Uh, no, I, I, am, I study animals. So this terminology that's being used is actually the study of an animal. Human traits are, although similar, very different. So it's kind of the problem with our society. We're, we're such in need of answers that we sometimes grasp for straws. And something may not relate to our life at all. But we will apply it. And we, as humans, tend to force squares into round holes. Because we need so very bad to have an answer. Because we feel like we can't exist without closure. So if there's a term floating around, like narcissist, and it seems to bring closure, hey, we're going to use it. Even if we've only studied it based off of one Google search. Even if we don't have access to speak to the author of the term, we make it fit where and what we need it to fit. Oh, you know, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, I, I get it. We, we, we stand on the shoulders of others and we build on it and we add to it and we make it fit us. But our individual experience could produce something completely different. And it's important that we get to know who we are and our experiences and that we formulate our own ideas to protect us, protect ourselves. You see what I mean? So this is the work that has to be done. So when you see me doing what I'm doing, and talking every day and doing these long old video, this video an hour and 22 minutes. This could easily be put in a classroom. And if a professor wise enough and not arrogant enough and not trapped in the idea that a person has to have a degree in order to know what they talking about. That 80 minute class can show this video and them kids may learn, them students may learn more from this one video in this human studies or this psychology class than they learn from any other textbook. Be, just because it's a, a real life example and it's the textbook talking. Instead of it being left to their interpretation, their comprehension, reading words from a page. Because you could read words from a page, but if you don't have the foundation of education, if you don't understand how to read and comprehend, you'll understand less about what you read than what you see. Because see, what you see, what you study in real life, you put it into your words. So that makes perfect sense to you. But see, when someone who has a higher level of education, a much broader vocabulary sees something they could see something similar or they could see something very different. And when they put it into their words, you read it and you misunderstand it because you don't have the comprehension of the vocabulary that they used. You understand what I'm saying? So this is the work that has to be done so that you know you and you know the type of humans you're going to be dating and dealing with so that you can't get taken advantage of because you know based on your studies, what the red flags look like. You know, you, you can see them a mile away. Hey, this Tony Gaston. And, um, and, and let me show y'all something now. What is the meaning and origin of narcissism? Entries related to narcissism. Narcissist, now, type of bulbous flowering plant. 1540s from Latin narcissus 
from Greek, Narcissus, a plant name, not the modern, not the modern Narcissus, possibly a type of iris or lily associated with the Greek narc, marked by excessive self-love. 1912, see Narcissism plus Istic. Now, do you see, I read from the homepage of Google, which is the only place that 99% of people get to, three different origins of this word. Three different origins. Somebody said 1898. Right up under that, the origin says from the 1540s and it says it's a plant. Now, didn't I just get done telling you that somebody could have been studying a bear and come up with a term and then later somebody take that term and apply it to a man? Somebody was doggone studying a plant, named a plant. And then that from the plant name then became put in other literature and art. And then now today, we got the word as a whole clinical diagnosis. You see what I'm trying to tell you? That's why you have to study people for yourself. Because a lot of times you could be labeling somebody something and you just the wrong is two left shoes. And walking in circles. You see what I'm saying? You have, and this is why I tell y'all, and hopefully you understand now, why I tell y'all I don't deal in these labels. Because I don't know the origin of what they talking about. People say, Tony, what, how you feel about Twin Flame? I can Google it. But Google half the time be all over the place. So, this person who created the word twin flame, although I could see this definition that Google's has, when if I could talk to the author, the creator, they might say it come from the spiritual world of when they was Satan worshiping because he is known to be in fiery flames. And they saw a correlation between him and the archangel and they called it twin flames because he used to be an angel and was kicked out of heaven and now is said to be in hell which is said to be hot which is said to be a unquenchable unquenchable fire so they come up with twin flames and then here we go somebody will read that with a ninth grade comprehension level and think it means that because them, him and her or her and him like the same kind of music and like the same kind of ice cream and their favorite color the same, they twin flame. Oh my God, I cannot believe we twin flame. Oh my God, we soulmates. And it could, it could be a bit more wrong, wronger than wrong and ain't got a clue because they read one definition off the first page of Google. You see what I'm saying? So listen, I went on this whole thing because as the Bible says, my people perish because of a lack of knowledge. But listen, when that was written in the Bible, Google wasn't available. Google wasn't available. You had to study people. You had to you had to hear from your creator. You had to get knowledge on another level. Hey, I gotta get ready to go. My son got pressed tonight. Hey, God bless you. We'll talk soon.